This is uh, Professor Cole, so I'm going to go over uh, a tutorial on how to use the ship calculation program and using this for your final projects. Um, and this uses MATLAB, so you, if you don't have MATLAB on your home computer, you can use the uh, mechanical, whatever your computing lab is called, your computing lab. So you'll be downloading a, a zip file, which contains all the MATLAB routines you need to do the calculations. So we'll unzip that. Uh, you start MATLAB. So put this probably, you can put this in your Z or B or whatever these, those drives are that allow you to share between machines. Start MATLAB. And, and once you're in there, and the Windows interface is a little bit different, but essentially uh, I'll check tomorrow to make sure this works, but um, I tend to use this, but if you're not comfortable with paths, I think you can use a open directory and sort of find your way to the folder. I have it on my desktop, so my desktop and ship calc. Um, open, okay, enable, oh that's for opening one file, get that, let's try this. We go to um, desktop ship calc open okay so now it says current folder here users g coles that's me desktop ship calc and in here are all your files the default matlab i think shows you this other little window here i'm not sure um, which has the different files in it you can actually um, you could actually open from here. I tend to do everything from the command line, uh, as you know, but otherwise you can keep it that way. It may be uh, more straightforward for you. Uh, with the Unix list command here, I can see all the files anyway. So there's a bunch of them in here, including some which are sort of left over from me playing around, um, which you won't see, but there's a bunch of files. The code that's MATLAB, anything with a .m on it here is a MATLAB file. Um, so let me just open it. Uh, through the finder on the desktop, desktop, um, where did I put it here, I think so, let me just get rid of this, this is not going to be there, and this is not going to be there for you, and neither with these, okay, so what you see here are a bunch of M files, or MATLAB code files, I'll open them one up in a second so you can see what it looks like, um, I also put in here, I'll put in here, um, a doc, uh, PhD thesis of this guy, uh, Doug Reed, that I found, and I actually did most of the coding based on his calculations, and he even included some MATLAB coding at the end of his thesis that actually saved me a lot of time right here, and his appendix is a bunch of code. So, um, so let me edit a file, uh, and actually what we'll do is, um, so these are all essentially functions that I wrote, and we can edit one, so you just type edit gen hull, for example, and this is the main script that generates the hull form you see here. And if you're familiar with C programmer and various programming, here's your function interface, here's your function name, this is output of which there is none, these are the input variables or uh, function parameters. Um, this, this is all commented, so commented code, the editor in MATLAB naturally makes it green, anything with a starting with a percent sign here is a comment um, it's not treated as actual code and then the coding begins down here this chunk of code right here will be displayed can be displayed right from the terminal here with a help so you can type help on any MATLAB commands for example plot it gives you a whole thing about how to plot or you can type um, the name of this was with Jen Hull and it will just basically reflect back the same chunk of code which is now disappeared in the background here um, is shown on the web to tell you how to use it. So, what Gen Hull does is it generates a ship hull form, uh, basically coordinates, XYZ coordinates, describing a wireframe or offsets uh, as a description of a hull form, probably the most basic possible description of a hull form. Um, and I use uh, Doug's suggestion at the end of this PDF, he goes through this sort of thing about how to generate. Um, a way of generating analytical hull forms, which you can read as Appendix C here, mathematically defined hulls. 
Um, so this enables us to manipulate these parameters in here, like F0, F1, F2, and F3. And by playing with those parameters, you can change the basic shape of a hull. Let me show you how that works in a second. So I have some examples here you can copy and paste. For example, here's a for tinkering. So we'll copy this one. So this is a generic uh, gen hull command. So I just basically highlighted it and control C. And I'll paste it in the MATLAB command prompt. And I'll hit return. Um, and I'll make a four figure plot. OK. So I'll describe what, I'm, what you're looking at in a second. Uh, just note here. Um, let me shrink down the command line window a little bit. Give me some room. Um, it also is giving me all this information about the hull form in terms of what we've learned this semester. Now, the arguments here, actually see it better in the, uh, in the help here. Here are the inputs. So the first input you're giving is a length in meters, beam in meters, draft in meters. And then these four things, which are directly from Doug's thesis here, control the um, the basic shape of the hull, and I'll describe how in a second. And I put some decent ranges that help will help guide you through this operation. And and there are some caveats uh, to this hull design. You can't make a transom stern. Um, the um, the center line is is naturally rectangular. Um, that's just uh, these are sort of basic caveats. So you know this isn't the fanciest thing in the world, but it's going to be fine for our project. Um, so this, this sort of stock, I just copied this gen hall and executed that command um, in MATLAB and it ran and it came back with all these sort of uh, geometrical information. So I tried to put as much information on the right here as I could to really describe these things. But you have length, beam, draft, wetted area, displacement, you should be familiar with these, delta, which is the uh, weight displacement, um, basically displacement times the uh, density of seawater times gravity, block coefficient, prismatic coefficient, midship coefficient, form factor. This is a volume coefficient which Doug uses um, in his efforts. And that's essentially an inverse uh, length to displacement ratio dis expressed as displacement in uh, meters cubed of the boat divided by the length cubed. Um, is a small number generally, so I, I multiply by 1,000 here, 8. Length to beam, beam to draft. Now these next ones all have to do, if you go back to your stability lecture, the transverse moment of inertia, the metacentric radius, the distance from CB to CG, which is something that um, is a bit fudgy because we're not stating where the center of gravity is. So I'm assuming that this is um, a certain uh, percentage of the draft, um, which may or may not be reasonable, but it's the best we can do. Um, GZ5, which is the writing moment arm, in, at, at, at a five degree angle of the heel, uh, so that's in meters. And then if you multiply that by the, the uh, displacement, um, you get uh, B times GZ5, which is basically from your lecture BGZ, um, which is the writing moment. This is in Newton meters, force times distance, a writing moment at five degree heel. So that's how much uh, moment is required to heel the ship over um, to five degrees. Um, it's quite a large number, as you can see. The CW correction is from Doug, Doug's work, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then you have your length to displacement ratio, and then these parameters that we're adjusting to create the surface, the, um, the hull shape, and are just reflected back to you. And this is the um, IE angle, which is the half angle of incidence of the water line at the bow. Um, I'll explain that right now. So if we come back to these uh, four figures and what you're seeing is um, first of all the 3D figure is shown here and you can manipulate the 3D figure by you can zoom it in if you want uh, zoom it out if you want um, and this little thing gesture thing here allows you to rotate it around if you want to look at it so let me move it and zoom it in here um, so you can have a look at this uh, hull shape uh, the lighting is kind of funny in MATLAB, but you can see that the hull exists on this whole plane. It basically flattens out to zero here. Um, and if I take, these are basically three ways of looking at a hull. These are sections, right? We've talked about this in class. Now, one of the restrictions of this hull making program is that there's no fore aft asymmetry. It's perfectly symmetric around the center line or midships of the boat, meaning the longitudinal center buoyancy will be at the center of the boat. And Doug has in his 
thesis, as you go further and further more complicated hulls, you're allowed to put in these more complicated functions, which just increases the number of parameters, but can generate hull forms like this, which have four aft asymmetry. Now we're restricting ourselves to four aft, no four aft asymmetry, four aft symmetry. So you see, starting at the bow here, this is like taking the same boat here, uh, sorry, and just, um, let me zoom it out, and just slice, 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 constant x all the way back, I think I put 20 slices, starting at the bow, moving to the midship, from the midship to the stern. See, there's no difference left and right, and so that's because there's four aft asymmetry. Um, so this gives an idea of how the volume is sort of distributed down the hull. You have maximum uh, section at the midships, and the sections get smaller and smaller as you get towards the bow, and it closes up. It's both closing up this way, meaning it's pinching off to a point, but also you see that the volume is moving up in the water, and you can see that here. I can get this at the right angle. Uh, you can see that is happening here as well. So you see how if you look at a section here and a section here and a section here, the volume's closing up, moving up in the hull. That's maybe most noticeable in what we call the buttock lines. So if you come back to this drawing here, now let's say we slice in Y. So I basically I'm looking at the top view of the boat, so I slice here, constant Y, slice here, constant Y, slice here, constant Y, such that the center line of the boat is Y equals zero and also a slice. If I do all those slices and I plot one, one side of those slices, because both sides are the same, it looks something like this. So then naturally if I bring this window out so it's the right aspect ratio, it probably would look something like this, so that the length and height are the same. So this is draft of the boat. This is up and down in the water column. This is the free surface. This is the keel of the boat down here. And this is the bow and or stern. This is the bow or stern. It's symmetric, so it doesn't matter. So those are those slices, and you can see how where the volume is here, um, and then if you take a slice a little bit closer, and so it expresses how this volume is distributed um, towards the end. So you can see here as you get towards the bow or the stern, so let's say towards the bow, that you have here that the volume is only from here to here. Anything below this point has collapsed into the center line plane. Um, so let's see if we can see that from here. You can sort of see it from, sorry, it's hard, a little bit hard to maneuver this. Yeah, you can see it here, right? So the volume's pushed up. Um, you can see that here, the volume is pushed up. This is the top view, these are water planes. The red line is the actual water line. The blue line is the water line. So we take this boat and you slice it here. That's the red line. Slice it exactly halfway down between the surface and the keel here. I think we have a five meter draft here. So at 2.5 meters, I slice it here. And that gives you the green line. As you can see, it's quite close to the red line. And then I slice, I think I put my bottom one pretty close to the bottom. So hmm, I think it's 12% uh, up from the bottom. So it'd be right about here. And this shows you how uh, two things. One is how, say at the midships, how U-shaped the sections are. Are they really tucking in like this, or are they say very slab-sided and then cut in right at the last second? But also, as you move forward, how the volume is changing. So we move forward to this point right here, and there isn't any volume above this point, this line right here. I'm sorry, below this line right here. All the volume is now above that. So this gives you an idea of how the volume is distributed fore and aft. Is it pushed fore and aft or not? Uh, depends on the sort of this blue line right here. Um, so we'll go through some of these. What I'm going to do is change these parameters as best I can to sort of see what happens um, in these windows. So I'll keep the older windows below so we can sort of make a comparison as we go along. Uh, and we can also see what happens to our coefficients here. So what I'm going to do is I'll go back to the help here. And so this F0, F0 directly controls how the water plane area is pushed to the ends. So keep an eye on this red line here. And more volume towards the end, recommend range 0.8 uh, F0, 2. 
Now you can go smaller than that, but the problem is the code that we'll be using to compute the wave resistance, which uses what's called a Michel integral, and that snippet of code is taken directly from this Doug's thesis, which saved me a lot of time of converting a C code that I had over. And that will not be accurate at all if you have a very bluff body. So I'm restricting, I would advise restricting yourself to this range where you will get very poor estimates of the wave drag um, as the thing gets very bluff. But I will show you just for a second. Let's just change that. So down here, here's the command that I executed to generate the hull on the screen now. These numbers are pretty squished together, so I'm going to just space them out and get a little bit here so you can see them a bit better. I'm having trouble seeing too. Okay, so that's length, beam, draft. This is the first number we're talking about. I'm going to crank this down to 0 0.2 even though it's smaller than the recommended value. I just want to show you what happens. So look up here at the water plane. I'm going to execute this. It's going to pull up uh, new numbers and also new four new figures. So give it a second. So you can see drastically what happened here. In particular, how the volume is now pushed to the end. See that? It's very, very slab-sided. And you can see it in this drawing here, um, how squared off it is at the bow. So it almost looks like a barge at this point. So one thing to look at is this last one, which is the, is the IE angle, which is a half angle of incidence. And all what that is, is what that is, if we go back to our original hull, it's maybe a little bit easier to think about. It's the angle, as the water line comes into the bow, it's the angle that it makes with the center line here. So it's this angle in here, is this half angle of incidence. The angle in our new hull is very, very large. You can see that it's almost, I don't know, 90, oh, see here it is right here, 81 degrees. So it's almost 90 degrees with the, uh, with the center line. It's pretty extreme versus this, which I forget what this came out to. Um, so I hope that's clear. So that's the best uh, way to look at that is what's happening in this water line. You can see that how this volume is pushed forward. This same section here, which is about 5% after the bow, has lots of volume right here. It's very still very fat. And when I go back to our original um, number, which what did we use originally? We used one, okay, for F zero. Sorry. I'm gonna put that back to one and rerun this again. Generate a. Um, you could see now. So that's originally what we had. You could see now the same section five percent back how different it is. There's very little volume in that because the hull is so much narrower towards the bow in this case compared to this case. Um, you can also see this incidence angle has fallen from 81 down to 16 degrees, something far more reasonable for that boat. So as I advise, I would not go, I don't know if there's a hard cutoff, but below 0 0.8 um, you're getting the bow and stern are too bluff and the, and the wave drag is just will be miserably inaccurate. It just is what it is. Um, so try to try to stick to this range here. Um, I think what I'll do is I'm going to skip ahead to F3. F3 controls if if F0 controls largely the waterline shape, the shape of this red line right here. F3 controls largely this section shape. The mid you think of it as the midsection shape, but it actually reflects itself in all the sections. We can think about the midsection shape here. It's pretty pretty U-shaped here. Now again, that, that midship coefficient is how much of, if you make it a rectangle of beam width and draft height, how much of that rectangle is consumed by the largest section is your midship coefficient here. What, I forget what the value came to. Um, it was uh, 0.87, so 87% of the area is consumed. Now if I go back um, and let's adjust, uh, let me close this here. Let me bring up the help again on Gen Hall. I forget which way this parameter goes myself. So control section CM. Larger F3 is a fuller section. So we have a section here. Now what I'm going to do is I have lots of windows open now. We're up to F12, 12 windows. So I'm going to close them. I type close all. It's going to get rid of all those windows. I'm going to rerun the previous case. Now you can use the up arrow to go through old commands. There's a bunch of ways you can do retype the command, paste the command, up arrow through the commands like I'm doing here. Or you can go over to this window here, which has a history of commands, and just rerun it by double clicking. Here's that one I want to rerun, so I'll double click that. 
So this is our baseline that we started with. Had a CM of 0.87. Um, okay, and now what I want to do is change this last parameter. What did we decide was needed to happen? Larger is fuller, okay? So let me change this to two. Let's just see if that's enough. Now keep an eye on this section up here. These are the sections again. These look like sections, but again, these are buttock lines. These are constant Y lines, the Y direction being transverse to the ship, meaning to port or starboard. So if you slice um, sideways the ship, that's what it ends up looking like. So we're looking at the ship from the side constant Y slices. So focus here. These are constant X slices. And um, let's just see what happens if it thickens up. It thickened up a little bit. Let me just make it a little more extreme up to three. There. Now you see it getting very fat. The sections of CM should be going up 0.95 now. We went up from 8.5 to 9.5 in terms of how U shaped these are. Very slab sided. Here's the keel here. And it reflects in all the sections all the way down. Um, and it does have some marginal changes on the other parameters, but largely it's affecting this section look. If I go the other way, I think we started at one, maybe make a 0.5 and you'll see how it is. It's much more um, rounded in shape. And let me see if we just take it down even to two. Can we do that? Now it's getting weird. So now we're getting some weird shapes in there, but it is possible to get lots of different shapes. We'll go seven. Seven's kind of rounded. So back to one where we were. So again, this is the, th the fourth of the three parameters which are titled F0, F1, F2, F3. We talked about F0, which changes the waterline shape and pushes volume forward and aft on the waterline. F3, which I skipped to, um, changes fundamentally the section look. I'll take it back to one. Um, now F2, let me skip to F2. Let me do a help on Jen Hall again. F2 prim primarily controls longitudinal volume distribution via the buttock shape. So focus here. Uh, let me close all the windows. We have a lot of windows open again. Okay, let me run our stock values, which I think is this. Okay, so here's our buttock lines. Then what I'm going to do, um, so for F2, which is this, F, sorry, F012, uh, F2 is this parameter right here. It's the second to last argument of our Gen Hall command. And we have, uh, what was I going to do? Um, F2, the buttock shape. M uh, smaller F2, more volume on the ends. So let's go make it a little smaller. Let me make it 0.15. Um, Differences are pretty subtle, so let me do a little more, more extreme range of values here. Let me start at one. So one is a pretty extreme range. You could see here, you could see here again in these buttock lines that there's almost no volume. Here we are a quarter of the way down the boat and the sections are very small. The volume is very small as we look at essentially this keel line of the boat, what is effectively the keel line of the boat, comes up very quickly. So there's very little bod volume forward here. Now if I go to the extreme, let's go the extreme other way. So that was with a value of 1. If I put the value at, I don't know if it will accept a 0, but I will try a 0. Okay, so if we do a 0, you can see that we have much more volume forward and aft. Um, and you can see here the buttock lines are almost vertical and you look at the section line. So essentially there isn't that same U, that same section which starts, here's our maximum section, the next section, that keel line is almost just about along the keel here. Essentially it is on along the keel here. So the volume is pushed as far as it can fore and aft. It's following the water line which is pinching up. But if we look up and down, um, the keel line is essentially flat right here, so the volume is not moving up as it was before. So let me just zoom this in and zoom. We have the previous one. Let me get this at a similar orientation so you can get a sense of how different these are. Oops. There. So you can see how different they are. This is a nice looking boat actually. 
um, where we push these sections all the way forward. That was with a value of zero for the parameter F2. Is that right? Um, F2, okay, so that's controlling the volume forward. I'll leave that at zero. And this last parameter, you may not have to adjust too much, which is F1. So again, I have F0, F1, F2, which we just put to zero. We put this at 0.5 for the moment. And one, which was controlling the section look. There's another variable which controls the section look. It basically allows you to create concavity in your sections. I go back to here. F1 controls the shape of the section in tandem with F3. Really, it's both of them working together. Equals one for circular U-shaped sections, depending on F3. So let's get a nice U-shaped section going. We put this to one. Let's see what we have here. That one's quite. So basically, you get a nice monotonic curve like that. Now I'm going to increase F3, make it more U-shaped. There it is, more U-shaped. Now what I can do is I've already forgotten which way to go. F1 greater than one. We can create concavity. Uh, concavities, much like a sailboat might look. Um, so let me go take this to four. Just oh, that's the wrong parameter. Um, this parameter up to four. Let's go even a little bit higher and maybe bring this one down. There. So you're getting now a wine glass look to the hull. I think we can maybe even go more extreme than that. There. This looks to me like often like a, the shape of a, a sailboat. So you have, or even a, a an offshore down easter. So you have more of a, a wine glass look with it with a stem on the or with a keel on the bottom here, um, in terms of a section. So those two kind of work together. Parameter F3, which is the last argument, and parameter F1, which is the third to last argument, um, kind of work together. So let me put this back to one. I forget what that will do. Kind of rounded sections, maybe like a, a, a rowing shell or a trawler, and then if I crank this up to four, I can get very U, very uh, much more U-shaped sections. Um, so anyway, play with this. You can see the effects here. So it's generating these images to help you visualize what the hull looks like, including the actual 3D image here. It's generating these values to guide you. So in your project, you may be looking to keep displacement at some number or beam within some number, etc. So it's beam your setting. So the displacement, by changing these parameters, is going to affect the displacement, basically all these parameters, CP and CP and CM and K. All these things are going to be changing as you change the shape of the hull. Um, so the thing you have direct control over, length, beam, and draft. After that, then you're controlling the hull shape with these four parameter parameters, which will affect everything else. So, um, so that's the hull. It's not a bad looking hull. I'm just going to actually take this down a little bit here. Okay. That's a good looking hull. So let's keep that for a second. Now what I can do is I can compute the resistance on this hull. So in running Gen Hull, it creates a file. A mat, it's a MATLAB file. Tinker.mat. Here it is right here. Um, because I named the hull Tinker, it generated this file tinker.mat. That's a binary file. You can't actually look at it outside of MATLAB. But what I can do is close my windows. So take a second. There are a lot of them. Clear my workspace. Clear all. Clears all the variables out. So all the variables come from the workspace. And I'm going to load tinker. And it generates. It loads in. Now I have a new variable that came in when I loaded that data file, which is hull. So I type hull. Hull is a structure in MATLAB. And hull contains these different parameters. So I'm just letting you know, you probably won't have to manipulate structures directly. I'm just letting you just know, know. So this is a structure and it contains different members like T or draft, which would be hull.t5. Or F3, that parameter we use to create the hull. F3 is 4. Or hull. Now these are matrices, so this is actually description of the hull in terms of points uh, in dimensions, uh, dimensional and non-dimensional form. And that these are the are the actual description of the hull um, at points, and that's generated when uh, when it's made. And these are what's known as offsets. So it's a way of describing hull. Basically, if you 
discretize your hull in terms of X and Z or along the hull and up and down. This is essentially Y as a function of that, which describes is one way of describing the shape of the hull, the simplest way of describing the shape of a hull, um, that table of offsets. Um, so this contains all the information needed for then other routines to go and do other manipulations. For example, compute resistance is compute resist. Compute resist takes one argument, um, and as I'm typing, MATLAB's telling me how to actually do this. Um, but I can also do a help on there. I think I put a, some help stuff in there. Let's see. Compute resist. Compute the resistance of the hull. Actually, I didn't actually say how to use it. I'll add that in there. But it takes one argument, which is the hull file. So ours is called Tinker. So it's going to read that Tinker data file. It's going to load it and compute the resistance on it. it. Takes a second. While it's running, I'll describe what's happening. So the resistance again has has the two components. We have the viscous component. So it's going to use the surface area. It's going to use, um, okay, so it's computing resistance across a range of fruit numbers, which it can convert to speeds because it has the whole length. So at various speeds, it's essentially computing the viscous resistance and wave drag, and then thus the total resistance. The viscous resistance uses the ITTC57 line and the wetted surface area and the ship speed and the water density um, and, the uh, yeah, and the coefficient of friction from the 57 line. The wave drag uses what's called a Michelle integral, which is talked about a little in your book. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, uh, I can't remember the chapter. It's in the chapter of numerical hull, numerical methods for hull design. I can't find it. Oh, here it is. So it's discussed chapter nine. Thin Ship Theory, section 9.5 of your book. Um, so essentially it's considering the hull as a bunch of source and sink terms over it, just like we did when we discussed how the transverse waves are generated and how they interact and how that influences the humps and hulls of the wave drag. This is considering many, many of them, of these terms along the hull and it's summing them all together over a range of, uh, of wave directions to come up with an estimate of the wave drag. It's a linear theory. It assumes the free surface is unperturbed. Um, it's a potential theory, meaning it doesn't take into account viscous stuff. But otherwise, it's, it's basically the fastest way of getting at a wave resistance. Um, it performs very poorly at high when the beam is high, um, high block coefficients. It, it, it basically over predicts the resistance. Um, so it's sort of used as sort of a back of the envelope um, calculation, um, but it can do some pretty fancy stuff. And so for things like rowing shells or very thin stuff, it's perfect. Catamarans, multi hulls. Once you get into bigger ships, and you have to be a little careful. But Doug's thesis was was basically using a nonlinear code and then training corrections using a neural network. He he devised a way of making corrections to the linear code. Um, by training a neural network to match the results from a nonlinear code or come up with a correction factor so that the linear version, the Michelle integral, match uh, this code called ship flow, which is a nonlinear code. And then he tested it out on hulls for which he hadn't that hadn't been part of the learning process of the neural network and it worked pretty well. So um, I used a very fudgy version of his correction factors to try to improve the wave drag estimate out of the Michelle integral. So essentially he computes this Michelle integral um, which, as I mentioned, I, have, I was in the process of converting from a C code I had, and I found that Doug just had basically pasted his in this thesis, and it works great. So that's what you're seeing there is Doug's effort. Um, it computes the wave resistance, and then friction again from uh, the ITTC57 curve. It computes them, so it's done, and it dumped it back into the file. So if I reload the file, uh, if I clear all the workspace, and I load Tinker, I will see in here I type hull, a bunch of new variables here, the velocity, which is a vector of size 25, the fruit number, which is a vector of size 25, the resistance, a vector of size 25, and I could even plot some of these if I wanted to, hull.u versus hull. I don't know, uh, rt. So that's the, the, that's plotting the stuff up. Um, I already have a routine to do this anyway, so I have plot, 
think it's plot resist. Plot resistance, again, one argument, actually two arguments. Plot resist takes two arguments. One is the hull um, that, that you're using to plot the resistance. Now you need to run the calc resistance calculator before you plot the resistance, otherwise it's gonna give you an error. Your second argument is a zero or one. So if you use a zero or plot in dimensional form, so this is our tinker hull. This is velocity in meters per second. This is the resistance in kilonewtons. So it will scale, if the resistance is pretty big, it will scale it down to kilonewtons, so it's easier to see. And you have friction drag in red, wave drag in blue, and friction including the viscous and form factor in red, wave drag in blue, and total drag in black up to a speed of 10 meters per second or 11 meters per second or something like that. Um, you can also plot in non-dimensional format, if you switch this argument to one, uh, this is, these are the non-dimensional drag coefficients, wave uh, friction drag CF in red, or actually CV, viscous, friction, uh, viscous drag coefficient in red, wave drag coefficient in blue, total drag coefficient in black. And there you see your typical dropping of the friction line and increase in the wave line and the humps and hollows, so you the prismatic uh, hump right here, right around fruit number 0.3, something like that. Um, so that's, uh, that's that. So you can also dump this to a file. It's, uh, I forget what it's called. It's uh, save resist. So save resist of Tinker. Saving drag file to tinker.txt. So there should be a new file in here. Here it is, tinker.txt. It's a text file with a lot of numbers in it. U fruit resistance and wave resistance and viscous resistance RT CWC etc. So it's the dimensional resistance components. I'm sorry, dimensional resistance components and the non-dimensional resistance components. And you can load this into Excel if you wanted. So for those of you who are panicking because you can't go to your precious Excel, uh, where are we here? We're on the desktop, right? So desktop. Chip calc, tinker text. Hopefully this will work. Open. <coughs> it's it's a tab delineated uh, data. Finish. There it is. So there, uh, there it is in Excel, and you can do I don't know whatever people do in Excel, but you can see I have the column headers here. Um, so that may be the format that may be more useful to you. Let me close that. So let me generate, let's generate another hull. So let's go back uh, to where we generated our original hull. What is that? Here, okay. So let's change one parameter. Why don't we change, um, well, let's just make it narrower. Let's keep everything the same and we'll make the beam, say, five meters instead of 7.5, so it's a narrower boat, everything else the same, the displacement will probably decrease, um, and I'm going to call this Tinker 2, okay, it looks very similar, it's just narrower, narrower, now I'm going to calculate the resistance of that, what is it, uh, compute resist of Tinker 2, now this will take a second again, it's looping through all the fruit numbers, um, that we've set up and computing a resistance for each of those uh, and then storing it. Okay, that's done. Now what I can do is I have two data files in here. Uh, so let's come back here. I have tinker.map, which contains the data from our first geometry run, tinker2.map, which contains the geometry from our second run with the boat with less beam. Now we can compare them. So instead of plotting resistance of one, where I can I can plot the resistance of Tinker 2 if you want to see what it looks like all alone. We'll do it in dimensional form. There it is. Now I'm going to plot it together. So I do compare resist Tinker 2. Uh, let's see, how do I do this? Tinker 1. No, it was just Tinker. And Tinker 2 and dimensional. Hopefully this will go. Okay. You see here, comparing the resistance, so all the drag components for the first hull, the beamier hull, are larger. There's more viscous drag, it has more wave drag, blue compared to blue, and more, um, sorry, my brain is 
failing me here. So and more total drag. So the solid lines are for the first hull, the beamier hull. The dash lines are for the second hull, the less beamier hull. You see the the friction drags up a little bit, but the big difference is really in the wave drag at high speeds, where the beamier hull is almost twice. So we cut the beam down by a factor of uh, a third, and we ended up with half the drag, or a little little more than half the drag wave drag at, at high speed of the um, of the original boat. So this allows you to compare two boats together, which is going to be necessary in your project as you are hopefully trying to make an improvement on your baseline. Uh, let me just look at my list of things I wanted to mention. I think that is all of them. Okay, that's it. That's the end of my ship calc demo.